Uh, I gave a version of this presentation at Davos in January, talking about democratizing big data, and uh, I feel like it was news there in this community. It is absolutely preaching to the choir. Every I was in the bathroom a minute ago, and people are talking about democratizing big data. Um, so I really feel like I'm back at home, though. Uh, so right after I graduated, uh, I had the opportunity to work with what was at the time the largest database in the world. Uh, it sat on those Teradata uh, data warehouse boxes. Those were a million dollars a cabinet, uh, and they held one terabyte each. And then imagine that. Uh, this was back in the 90s, uh, the 1990s. Um, and it was the Walmart data warehouse. It had all the customer transaction data from Walmart. And the way I ended up there is immediately prior, I had been at the AI lab working on Danny Hillis's connection machine. At the time, the most powerful computer in the world, uh, 16,000 processors. And what I was doing with it was uh, the first commercial neural nets. And the neural nets themselves I was passionate about, I still am passionate about, but they were capable of solving uh, virtually but many, many, many valuable problems. And what happened to me, we were working at the time on um, cancer detection, on handwriting recognition, on stock market forecasting, on face recognition, uh, counting items like airplanes on tarmac, a whole variety of use cases. Uh, but what I ended up doing is handwriting recognition. So back before the turn of the century, back in the 1990s, we had these things called pencils and pens, and we would write these things called characters with them. And then uh, people at the post office would spend laborious amounts of time reading these and then routing letters to the right place or reading tax forms and getting the, getting the numbers right. Uh, so we automated that. And um, the reason we automated that particular problem was specifically because the data was available. The National Institute of Standards had accumulated about 250,000 examples of handwriting uh, samples that they had manually classified. Uh, and because the data was available, we used it really originally as a test case for the neural nets. We weren't trying to commercialize it. We were just testing the neural nets. But because it worked, we ended up commercializing it. And that's really the theme of my story today is that in those days, we had to follow the data and we would commercialize wherever the data was available. So things like cancer detection moved off the radar because the data was not available. There were all kinds of PII concerns, but handwriting recognition uh, data was available. We ended up installing the, the software on these uh, really fast paper transports that would take tax forms, and you would see the stack of tax forms this high go through that machine from scan optics at a rate where the paper would go like this. And the cameras would capture images of it, and we would classify all the handwriting on it. Uh, that turned into a couple million dollars of revenue, which uh, is not huge by today's standards, but it changed my life because it allowed me to do the next thing. Uh, worked with another supercomputer company, uh, Massfar, at the time, and they took me down to Walmart, and that's a Walmart. And at the time, Walmart uh, was opening super centers, and super centers had groceries in them, and super centers involved perishables. So Walmart was going bananas because of the bananas. If you look in this store, everything in this store will last 100 years. You don't have to worry about it except this thing, these bananas are good for about three days, and then they turn into fruit flies. Uh, so they had no system for predicting exactly how many ba bananas would be purchased in any location at 2,500 stores. So how many bananas will be sold in the next week in every store uh, around, the, around the country? So because they had the data available, they had invested a huge amount of money in collecting the data from all the stores into their headquarters. That's their headquarters in Bentonville, Arkansas. And these enormous satellite dishes would capture the data. Uh, and because that data was abundant, we solved that problem. That was worth another few million dollars. Got very, very lucky in the next wing of this where the people who ran data warehousing at Walmart ended up becoming, uh, Rick Dalzell became the number two guy at Amazon.com. And that introduced me to URL stream data, so internet clickstream data. And we applied the same technologies to the clickstream data, again, because the data was abundant. So that company ended up being acquired for just about a billion dollars at the top of the bubble. So here I'm going through this chain of events that are entirely driven by the data and re really relying on luck to find the next big opportunity, which turned out to be very big, but, but way too much luck. That mode of operation is not going to work going forward for the next generation of machine learning people, and it's not going to work for this exact reason. The founding age of new billion dollar value companies, the highest bar on this chart is age 20 to 24. That chart, the entire time I've been doing this, has moved left and left and left, and it's going to continue to move left. And you're going to find companies like WhatsApp that go from idea to $19 billion valuation in just a couple of years. 
But it's not gonna happen in the machine learning world unless we make the data available in a much more intelligent way so that the people that are early in their career can have access to it in a very, very intelligent cho choose your business plan kind of way. Um, so what we're doing to try and solve this problem, and Sandy is working on very aggressively, and we're working on very aggressively uh, at XPRIZE, is a way to make the data available in PII secure ways, but abundant across many, many use cases. And that's all the time I have, but I'll tell you more about it when I get back.